Good afternoon. Welcome to uh, the fifth in our winter series of Philosopher's Cafes. Um, I think uh, the first thing I'm going to say is that um, uh, one of our animateurs for today um, suffered a mild heart attack uh, on Wednesday and is not able to be with us. Uh, I can assure you, that, how, however, that he's quite all right and being well taken care of, and it's not very serious. Um, the um, next thing I want to do is announce that, um, that oh, I didn't give his name, no, that's Paul Viminitz, right? and um, in a few minutes uh, Rebecca will be introducing Simon Harrick, who will animate this cafe. Um, our last cafe is coming up uh, next week, not two weeks from today, but one week from today. Um, of course, right here at the same time, and uh, it will be the topic will be justice and future generations, and the uh, animator will be uh, Jennifer Welshman, who has uh, animated cafes in the past. She's a professor of philosophy at the uh, university in my department, and um, she um, uh, uh, has done a lot of work on this particular question of uh, whether uh, matters, of, uh, whether our relationship to future generations does involve matters of justice and obligations and things of that sort. So um, she will be here to lead the discussion uh, in one week's time, and that will be the final cafe for this series. But uh, we will certainly be planning a, a new series for the fall, and uh, we'll be getting out news about that to you um, in, sometime in the summer. Uh, in the meantime, if um, you want to make suggestions uh, about topics uh, to, to treat uh, in a future series, uh, please see me, or uh, you can... Uh, Email me. My address is very simple. It's uh, martin.tweedale uh, at ualberta.ca. Um, so um, uh, I'd be happy to receive those uh, suggestions. Um, now, uh, there is a woman here who, her name is Joan. Yep. Yep. Yes, Joan, uh, who wants to make an announcement, and then Rebecca will come and introduce Simon, who will animate the cafe. Joan. Thank you. Is, is, is that all right? Uh, um, first of all, thank you for letting me make this announcement. I appreciate it. Uh, how's that? Did you get the thank you, though? Because that's important to me. Thank you for letting me make this announcement. So, um, I my name is Joan Iwasu, and I'm a doctoral student at the University of Alberta in counseling psychology. And I'm doing my dissertation research on meaning and purpose in life life and hope. It's a qualitative study and I'm looking for participants. And um, uh, to, the two main criteria to be eligible to, partic to participate in the research are that the individual be 60 years of age or older and that um, there are reasons for that, good reasons for that. And I'm glad it makes you smile. Um, and the second criteria is that the individual um, feel in, in their heart that they are living their life currently with meaning, purpose, and hope. And so I uh, have brought a sheet that essentially tells you what I've just said and also gives you my contact information. And so if... if um, you are eligible and interested, wonderful, and if you're not, please feel free to keep a copy, uh, or to take a copy, and to pass it along to someone who you think might be. The next old person you see. Uh, <laughs> <Bring it back. laughs> okay, we'll, we'll end it there. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> so if you can just
I'm a little disappointed to hear that I can't live with meaning, purpose, or hope in, for another about 20 years, but, you know, no, that's okay. I'm just, I'm totally joking. No, I'm totally joking. That's why I hang out here, because I'm hoping that some of these, these esteemed, wise folks who join us at the cafes will pass on some of their meaning, purpose, and hope to me. But anyway, um, thanks, Joan. Thanks for sharing that. Um, it's my pleasure today to introduce our guest uh, speaker, Simon Herrick, and I I, I sort of want to say at the beginning that I think Canada owes him an apology, <laughs> because it seems like during his visit here, he's, he's had one disaster after another in terms of losing uh, fault, really. his passport and other minor items like an iPad and whatever. So um, I'm hoping that our, his experience today will convince him that there are some good things about Canada. The people, and most of the them, people are great. Yes, most of them are here at Steeps. But <laughs> um, Simon is the director for the Center for Peacemaking at Marquette University in Milwaukee, and he received his MDiv from the Jesuit School of Theology at Berkeley, and a master's and a PhD in ethics from Notre Dame. He entered the Society of Jesus, which is an order of Catholic priests, in 1970, and as well he helped found an organization called Voices in the Wilderness, which took donated medical supplies to Iraq um, in the situation around yeah. the wars. And that organization has been nominated several times for a Nobel Peace Prize. Um, Simon has a, several books, including a book called Nonviolence for the Third Millennium, and another one called Virtuous Passions. He's an active participant in the peace movement, and he has a lot of excellent stories. So will you join me in welcoming Simon Herrick? Thank you, everybody. Uh, one of the features of coming here to Canada is how many nice people I've met. I, I already knew Dittmar and Pat from down in California, but everybody here seems very nice and kind and uh, not like New Yorkers at all. Because the, uh, <laughs> evidently the story is that some tourist came up to a New Yorker and said, can you tell me how to get to Times Square, or shall I just go to hell? <laughs> Once, I guess, there was this nice, I was this a scene in the subways of New York where a woman was talking into her cell phone and she, in the subway, and she was saying, I can't believe you've left me. I can't believe, now you always said you were going to love me, you were always going to stay with me, and now that I'm pregnant, pregnant, you leave me, you son of a gun. She's cursing and swearing at him, and a whole group of um, New Yorkers came around her, very concerned. They said, you're getting reception in the subway? What, what service do you have? <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, um, I guess we're here to talk about justice and war, and I guess like a true academic, we've got to start. Uh, we've got to start determining what these terms mean. Um, we ought to just start off with war, huh? Because we, because um, I, I have a presupposition. It's pretty well. It's pretty well um, verified by anthropologists that violence is not natural to human beings. We just. It's not a natural a act for. A for a human being to do violence to another human being. In fact, there is no anthropological evidence uh, for any human being doing violence to another human being until about 6,000 years ago. That's the first time we've discovered uh, flint in the bones of, uh, of human beings. So for the however many year, millions of years we were around before that, there is no archaeological evidence. Now, that doesn't mean that we didn't do it, but you would think that it would show up before that if we were around for about three million years that there, all of the of all of the fossils and all of the cave paintings and everything else like that there would have been some record of, of us doing violence to one another also uh, anthropologists tell us that there are certain tribes which have never done any violence to each other they have they have elaborate rituals of, and contests and things like that but they don't harm one another uh, let alone do that kind of destructive violence to each other so if it were that's a proof that, uh, uh, it's pretty solid proof, that if it were natural for us to do violence, it would show up all over the place. But since we can find certain tribes where violence is simply not done, it's not a feature of, uh, of, a hum of human nature that's natural. It's not a natural. And here's, a, here's another thing, I think, uh, that may, may not be a proof, but it's something that draws my attention. Look at how much and how intensely we have to train the military, our people in the military to kill. It, the, the stress is so important that 
Uh, back, uh, Gwyn Dyer, who, I don't know if he's, he's, a, he's a war historian, is he Canadian? Yeah. Oh, yes. okay, so I can quote him, good, we know good, right, good, here. yeah, good. He, uh, he one of his uh, researchers dis discovered that during World War II, on, uh, in, in combat rifle companies, only 25% of the people who were in rifle companies in combat fired their weapons. What's that all about? I mean, there must be some kind of a natural inhibition, even in war, when people are shooting against against you, not to fire, not to shoot, not to kill another human being. Um, of course, the military also observed this and tried to re redress this terrible problem, uh, and uh, they dropped. They realized that what they were doing that was wrong was that they're not only were they teaching people how to kill, but they were also teaching them about motherhood and apple pie and Americanism and patriotism. And that made them more and more rounded and complete human beings. And evidently, the more human you become, the more unable you are to do violence. So they dropped all of that motherhood and apple pie uh, garbage. And then they just started stressed strictly on killing, 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 killing. And by the time we got to Vietnam, 50% of the people in combat had fired their weapons. So we, we're working on it. We're, we're achieving that, that goal pretty, pretty clearly to keep turning our people more and more into killing machines. So it's not a, it's not a, natural, it's not a natural result, uh, a natural characteristic of human beings to do violence to each other. It's not. And also, one more thing, uh, are the new biology people and neurophys neurophysiology people show that the brain, our brain, works best when we're in cooperation with other people. Because it turns out that how we evolved above the other animals, for, or basically for two reasons, we could cooperate better as, as a community than the other animals could. We work better than, what, did you ever see apes? Apes forage for themselves. But, but, um, but the humans found out ways to share, and one of the main reasons that we did that was because of babies. Our babies, our human babies, are so dependent for so long that we had to develop a whole, a whole social structure for the care of babies where, you know, women would kind of take care of and nurse the babies and the men would have to go out and get food for the women and children and bring it back and then they had to learn about distribution of, uh, and then they had to have language so that people could say what, what went on out there and what went on in the homes and then, of course, the old, the uh, rituals for development of, and when, you become a, a, a full male and when you become a, whole, a full female, all of those kinds of things that, that caused us to become more human and more and more evolved than everybody else, none of that had anything to do with violence. All of it had to do with cooperation and especially in the case of babies, taking care of the vulnerable instead of taking advantage of them. So in that case, for example, if somebody had a sprained ankle, it was no longer a fatal injury. You could stay in the camp with the women and the children until you recovered, and then you could go back out again. So most of all, we evolved because of our ability to take care of the poor and the vulnerable, and that's what made us human, which is why, well, I won't do the plug for Christmas, but anyway. <laughs> so let's think about what we mean when we say war, which is an organized group of people, right, trying to, or, or trying to attack or inflict violence upon another group of people at least that in its most basic form. But um, we, again, we don't see any kind of evidence of that until the first cities about 6,000 years ago. It seems that somehow the accumulation of goods inspired uh, people to say, well, I want what you got, which is, I still think, the cause of most wars. So at least that's something that we want to keep as a framework. And when we look at the kind of history of war and what history of warfare, even during the Middle Ages, um, there were certain battles where nobody died at all. The, you know, the people with generals would come, and the, or the leaders of the battle would come, and there would be certain maneuverings and maybe some skirmishes, and then the, the leaders of the battle would say, well, this, this is not going to work, or you won, or we didn't win, and then people would just withdraw. So, um, and a lot of the times when we think about this famous just war theory, the just war theory was created in that kind of atmosphere. It's not, it doesn't seem to apply that much to the kinds of warfare that we do nowadays. Uh, warfare essentially changed uh, with Napoleon, who uh, developed what we now call total war. Total war meant that, um, that 
in universal conscription, everybody between the ages of 18 and 40 was conscripted into the military, and all of the resources of the new nation state, as nation states were just beginning to develop then, all the resources of the nation state were focused on waging war. That's what we mean by total war. Everything, everything is, is thrown into the, um, to, um, the war effort. And that's one of the reasons, of course, that Napoleon was so initially successful and why he was eventually defeated was because the other countries also adapted this total war posture and then once the, the ground was even or and then he was outnumbered three or four countries to one, then he was finally defeated. But so most of the war that we now know of in, in the world is not like the warfare that was true, say for example, for Romans or for Greeks when only certain group of people would be named as the warriors. Not everybody, there would be a certain group of people that were named as warriors and often it was passed from father to son. So a certain class of people, a group of people, or family of people, they would be the warriors. And it was a very small group percentage of people, it wasn't everybody. But now in days when we think of war, we think of total war because that's all usually we've ever known. But when we think of the history of, of war, and also when we think of when things like just justice and war were spoken in the same sentence, we were talking about a completely different circumstance, set of circumstances than we have now. Here we are in the third millennium. So let's now we think of war. Let's let's make sure that we that we're talking about the right thing. That the when we were thinking about just war, there were it was really a, narrowed down to a very small group of specialized people who would engage in conflict not like it is now. So we can't quite apply the, the uh, concepts that we had uh, from 2,000 years ago to something that we're doing now. But now that we've kind of at least gone over justice and violence in general, how about if we think a little bit about, I mean, how about if we think about a little bit of the concept of justice? What does that mean? There's, a, there's a many different kinds of justice, I know. Um, um, and one, we could say now, for example, um, there's distributive justice, sometimes called economic justice, which means everybody should have you know, equal access to the resources of, of goodness in the world, air, water, food, clothing, shelter, the basic needs, and, and certainly also for humankind, a certain degree of dig dignity. That would be distributive justice, that the resources are fairly distributed to people who need them, even medical care, whatever. Uh, then, of course, we have um, sometimes called procedural justice, which is whatever whatever justice system you've set up, there should be a certain there should be fairness in the way that it's being executed. And then we have then retributive justice, which is the justice that most of us are familiar with. Somebody does something, and you punish them. I don't think it's the most successful way of thinking about justice, but it's most of the way we think about justice. It's always crime and punishment. So, and the punishment we hope fits the crime, but oftentimes does not. Um, and then finally, we have something that we work on at the Center for Peacemaking, which is called restorative justice. In other words, the, the, the goal then is to reintegrate the offender back into the community and to have the community recover from the rupture of community that is violence. One of the essential ways that I want to define violence is as the rupture of community. We belong with each other. And you know something that's really kind of cool? I was doing this study when I was doing my dissertation that it turns out that within a tenth of a second of our physical association with each other, we start matching metabolisms with each other. It's fascinating, really. Heart rate, breathing, con skin conductivity levels, within a tenth of a second of our physical association, we start matching metabolisms with each other. We're like human Legos. We, we literally kind of belong with each other. We just click with each other right away. And my sister tells me that she, when she works in an in a office with all, all women, after a while they all get their period together. It just goes to, it just says that we're just, we're in rhythm with each other all the time. Sometimes they talk about the contract theory of justice as though we had to contract to be with each other. But I think we're naturally supposed to be with each other and to be in harmony with each other. And that's also another definition of justice, harmony with each other. We're naturally supposed to be that. And then, the, the, then we have the virtue of justice that works that out so that it becomes more and more perfect. That association, that natural association that we have with each other, 
the virtue of justice brings that to its fruition so that all of us can come to the fullness of humanity together. So that for me is why it's why um, restorative justice is so important. When the offender has, has, has done something to disrupt the community, hopefully the community has those bonds, has been over the years developed those bonds, of that's natural bonds, and over the course of the virtue of justice has developed strong enough resources such that it can, re, it can reintegrate the offender back into the community and that, that makes the community stronger, just like when you're, a bone is broken and when it heals, it's much stronger at that point that it was healed than it was before it was broken. A community that is able to restore itself after the rupture of, of, of violence is much stronger afterwards than before. And I've noticed that happening in all of the times that we've done our restorative justice circles at, at Marquette, in Milwaukee, in, uh, in Chicago, back in the United States. So that restorative justice is another kind of justice I think that we want to think about that I think is a little bit better than retributive justice. Um, then of course, and then we've also mentioned distributive justice. So there are different forms and kinds of justice that we need to know about if we're going to talk about war. We, what kind of war are we talking about? And then what kind of justice are we talking about? Now I'm a priest, so I'm going to talk about divine command justice so that there's... God says you have to do this, so okay, do it, that kind of thing. There's a divine command, justice. And then certainly is there's uh, people who get together and say, well, we are in a community, and what, do you, what are going to be the rules here, and how are we going to operate together? So humans can get together and kind of agree on what justice would be. I just want to point out one thing, though, and that is because I come from the, an empire, the sole remaining superpower left in the world, that, we, that it's very easy for people who have dominative and violative power, as does the United States, to declare that this is just and no one can say, no, it isn't. So I always like to include in my understanding of justice a kind of a preferential option for the poor and the oppressed, who usually don't have a voice, who usually can't have a say. Because if we want to have a balanced community and we listen only to the people who can inflict harm or divide or can kill, then I don't believe that that's a good idea of justice. You know that every time the United States uh, goes to war, we, we put the word just in. Operation just cause, operation just this, operation just killing people. Anyway, uh, it's just something I want to watch out for because if we aren't attending to people who have no voice, if we aren't attending to the poor, then we are, we're, we're fracturing that human community that makes us human and that once we start losing our humanity, what are we fighting for anyway? So. Uh, so that's kind of the background of what I want to I want to go with, and then I don't know what you where you want to take it from here. Let's mention you want to mention holy war. Let's go holy war. What the heck? Uh, um, holy war, of course, it, it, you can kind of understand it by maybe comparing it to what just war is. That you have to have it. They want to call it just war has a just cause, but in holy war, the cause is just transcendent. In other words, it can never be criticized because it's divine or whatever. It's democracy or freedom or apple pie. And it's never criticized. You can never say, well, wait a minute, that can't be right because it's, it's transcendent and it, it's, as it were, immune from any critique. And it also means that um, the entire people, again, also would be engaged and that everybody on the other side of that war is evil and there is no protection for them as far as they're not human anymore. They've, they've stopped being human, and therefore uh, they have no rights. They have no, there's no rights of war. There's no uh, rights for, for capture or for prisoners of war. There's no protection for the innocent because nobody's innocent on the other side. They're all <coughs> evil. So you divide the world into good and evil. We're the good, and the evil must be destroyed. And there are no holes barred when it comes to holy war. So a crusade, for example, would be one. And, of course, Catholics got very into that during the Middle Ages. Um, and I think pretty much almost every war, of the, la the last two or three anyway, has many, many more characteristics of a holy war than it does of any other kind of war that we would call just or would have anything to do with justice because of the terrible uh, destruction that is wreaked upon the other side in the name of whatever cause we, we say it is. So, for example, you remember in, in back in 2003, we engaged in what was called shock 
and awe. Now, what was shock and awe? The, sh the purpose of shock and awe is to uh, attack and terrorize the the the, uh, the regular civilian population to such a degree that they that they that they lose their will to resist. So you you need you know that for example to attack women, children, old folks, young folks, non-combatants, and to terrorize them, blow their houses up, dismember them with no protection, whether they're combatants or not, whether they're babies or not. This is not the characteristic of any kind of justice that I can think of. But it would be if you would say, this is a holy war, we have our divine mission, and all we're the very good people, or the only, the, the absolutely good people, and these other people are absolutely evil and deserve to be destroyed. You see a lot of that course in the Old Testament as well when God supposedly orders these people to just wipe out this other people off the face of the earth we don't want to see the last we got their cattle to get them out of there that kind of thing is kind of the, the characteristic of, of holy war uh, I think that as we especially in the United States assume great more and more of a delusional understanding of ourselves as the saviors of the world uh, almost all of our wars are holy wars. I think the ultimate, finally, the ultimate holy war would be nuclear war, right? I mean, everything goes. Nobody else lives, and it doesn't make any difference even if the person who initiated the war doesn't live because he's now, he, that person or, or that country that initiated the war has, as it were, sacrificed the country's being in order to, to eliminate evil from the world. In which case, of course, if we, if we do have a nuclear war, we will have eliminated just about everybody in the world except for, of course, the cockroaches, who seem to be uh, immune to uh, radiation. Which, and I think that's how they, we actually got nuclear weapons. I think uh, cockroaches invented them so they could rule the world again. <laughs> but, um, so I just want us to, keep, to throw out some, some concepts. If we're going to talk about justice, what kind of justice do we mean? Do we, do we mean distributed justice? Do we mean economic justice, that everybody gets a fair share according to their human dignity, according to, I would say, you know, the presence of God within them? Do we mean restorative justice, that we would go to war in order to include people back, uh, or wake people who are wrong back into a human community? Do we mean retributive justice, that you, we did this, you did this wrong, and therefore you're going to have this punishment? And then, of course, the question comes, is the punishment proportional to the crime? Those kinds of questions. I'd like to throw those out there to all of you as while we're trying to think about justice and war. And I have a, one more question. Is it ever possible to have, now that we hear in the third millennium, is it ever possible to have a just war? Now that blanked a whole bunch of faces, didn't it? <laughs> right. Um, so uh, we will open this for discussion. and. Um, uh, the discussion will go on to maybe a quarter after 2 or 2.30 uh, when we'll take a break uh, for 20 minutes to refresh our drinks and everything. And, uh, and then we'll resume the conversation, uh, but uh, we have to bring it to a close at 3.30. Now, in this discussion, um, I will try to um, organize the comments a bit. Uh, so that uh, once somebody's opened up a topic, then people who want to speak to that same topic uh, will have priority over people who want to start a new topic. So um, I uh, uh, invite you to um, ask questions or just make comments or whatever. Uh, Hi, Johnny. How's it going? Um, I don't know yet. Oh, good. No, we'd like to I wonder if you would consider whether conscience, charity, those sort of things play a role in justice, or is justice about that? Well, I think that those are kind of things that justice, and, I mean, conscience and charity are are certainly virtues that would contribute to a, a better understanding of a, of a just society. I don't think you can operate a just society without that. But... Um, those are surely human characteristics that we would have to develop as, uh, as virtues clustered around that, that virtue of justice in order to achieve justice, yes. Anybody else want to speak to that topic? No? Okay, we can proceed to a new topic. Right. I was just wondering whether or not there's any culture that do you know of where women have started the war. <laughs> Margaret Thatcher. 
This, all this evidence that you uh, recited, with which I agree and find very compelling for the inherent cooperative nature of humans, all this evidence is not only a devastating critique at the, of the very foundations of war making, but of a capitalistic system, uh -oh. and I don't know how anybody could possibly support a capitalist system as, as, uh, as being re reconcilable with uh, justice. Well, I, I, really, I really appreciate that, that question because I'm, I'm thinking, I think we both think along the same lines. I, I do, however, because I'm one of those Catholic people you hear about, um, that we have this, this long, long tradition of what we call Catholic social teaching. It's well over 100 years old. And th there have been some powerful statements made about uh, both a socialistic approach and a capitalistic approach to human, human living. And um, the, the, there are critiques on both sides. The basic thing, I think, that, um, that the, church, the Catholic Church crit critiques about um, capitalism is that the extreme individualism and the, and the ex excessive uh, acquisition of wealth and the definition of a human being, by, the value of a human being by how much wealth he as an individual acquires. The, what, the, the, what they want to say is, what they say is that uh, private property is allowable, but only because that person is, is using that private property in such a way that it benefits the whole community. The essential de definition of property in the, uh, in the Catholic social teaching is that all property is common property, and that individuals can as it were, manage certain areas of private property for the, for the greater good. But that uh, the, essentially, if, for example, it gets a little radical, if, for example, uh, someone has need, and you, you it would never happen to you, but if you had a great deal of, of resources, and someone had need and had hunger like uh, Jean Valjean and stole a piece of bread from you, he would not be technically called, be named as stealing. You would be because you have been taking away from the common good this property which belongs to the common people in such a way that the common people don't have enough access to live dignified lives. And by the way, uh, the way the Catholics talk about, about uh, how much property you should have is you should have as much as you need to live and a little more. And the little more is, oh, I want to have time and a couple of bucks to go and sit in the Philosopher's Cafe and buy some tea. Because that's kind of, that's a human thing. Or I want to go to a concert. Or my daughter needs to have her teeth whitened because she feels, you know, and I can pay a couple bucks for that. Because those are human things, you know. Not survival is not, is certainly a human quality and a human value, but that little more, that little more that, be, that lets for art and lets for community and allows for beauty and, and sustaining the, sustaining the world and our community, that's the little more. So enough for, that you need to live and a little more. So uh, I like that particular definition. Not a lot more, just a little more. Um, uh, Simon, uh, how then does the Catholic Church uh, justify the enormous quantities of wealth that have been collected in the Vatican? I think we have to pay off all those uh, lawsuits, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> Do you see any? Oh wait, wait, so, excuse me. That's okay. Uh, this That's person right. now. No problem. Okay. And, uh, I'll come Martin next. Martin Nader will go first. Oh, he's he's <laughs> yielding to me. Put it close to. How's it going, Kathy? <laughs> Do you see any possibility of the world realizing? that war does not, is never the answer. There's a better way. Um, I, think that, I think that after a while it may, it may occur to us, certainly after the collapse of the American empire, that will surely occur. But uh, I think that, that maybe there are enough movements, say for example the ecological movement, is sure, it is also a powerful influence to say that 
the, the ecological destruction of even a single war, the, the planet can't sustain that much, much longer. We can't sustain another, say, two or three wars because then the planet already is degrading and we would not be able to sustain war just on an ecological level. And then, of course, you've seen what the wars of America have done to the American economy. I hope you don't think that a, that a couple of foreclosed houses tanked the American economy, did you? I mean, what the heck? This is the most powerful economy in the world, and then all of a sudden it tanked. It may be because every every year we spend seven hundred and fifty billion dollars, three hundred or well, three quarters of a trillion dollars on war. That's that's minimal, because that's just for the Pentagon. We also spend fifty percent of the of the NASA budget on war. 80% of the Department of Energy is spent on war, and then of course there's all the black budgets, and then there are supplemental incomes. We spend enormous amounts of money, somewhere in the neighborhood of twenty-five dollars to $30,000 a second on war. We, no one can sustain that kind, no, no economy can sustain that kind of, of, uh, of output for, not, for a non-productive non uh, operation. So um, either, either ecologically or economically, I think it's eventually going to dawn on people, we just can't afford this. We can't afford to do this. I hate to, to think that it would take some kind of an outside force and not you know, a human nature saying, look, there are as you just say, there are better ways to resolve this. But I do know that there's a, there are grassroots movements in the United States now. One of them is called tribes. You should look them up on the, on, it's, it's what they're doing is they're saying, look, at the indigenous peoples, had ways of resolving difficulties. They would stand around, they would, everybody would stand around in a circle if there was a problem. Everybody would have equal say, and everybody would try to say, okay, this is the difficulty. Why did it happen? What were some of the effects? And how can we restore our community once this has taken place? This is beginning to take place pretty much all over the world. And maybe uh, after a while, in a grassroots way, people will begin to realize that the grassroots and community ways, the local community ways of handling difficulties, where everybody is given equal voice and equal respect. It's surprising how much wisdom there is. I've seen those circles operating with 15 and 16 year old kids, and you, you hear those 15 and 16 year old kids and they're talking like grown-ups, or you wish, wish they were talking the way grown-ups you wish would talk, you know? It's fascinating to watch these kids handle problems within their own classroom or in their own uh, bullying or in their own uh, or in their own schoolyards and come up with what would be a good way to resolve the issue and what would a good way to make a community such that this kind of thing doesn't happen. I think as we educate more and more, and uh, even ourselves, as we sit down instead of turning so much as we do to, you know, punish these people, just punish them, that's all. Throw them in jail, that'll be a good thing. Well, by the way, I was wondering, there's a, there's a country on the face of the earth that has its greatest percentage of its population in prison than any other country in the world. I wonder what that country might be. <laughs> yes, it is, right. Although I'm told by some of you that you're trying to catch up. <laughs> don't, if you don't mind, right? So it's not working, really. And I hope that someday, even for just practical purposes, somebody dawns on something, wait a minute, it's not working. And we can't sustain it, you know? It's, it's not achieving what we want to achieve. In fact, it's achieving what we don't want to achieve. It's, it's economically ruining us, it's ecologically destroying us. We can't do this anymore, we've got to find other ways of resolving this. But I also think that we also have to kind of change, as, we, as our, my friend back there had said, we have to change our understanding of, of consumerism. You know, we really just, the acquisition of these, of goods and, and resources, we can't just keep doing that, you know. We're, the United States, for example, we are 5% of the world's people. We consume 25% of the world's resources. Now, is that, does that mean that the rest of the, of the world, the other 95% of the world, are volunteering the health and the well-being and the future of their children so that we can drive SUVs? I don't think so. I think it's being enforced by the most lethal military in the history of the world. And if that's the case, if that's the dynamic behind it, we want their stuff, or as some of the... As some of the resistors say, what's our oil done doing under their sand? Yeah. Um, if we want their stuff, we're always going to have to take it by force. So once again, I think we need to return to that sense of human community and sharing. Even, for example, just think about everybody here probably has, you know, maybe their own television, you know, or maybe their own washing machine, you know. Maybe every household has its own washing machine. Do we really need, does every household need a washing machine? Can we have three families, four families in a particular area, and one 
washing machine and they say, okay, we kind of go in cycles. You have to do it anyway with your teenagers. But the thing is that, uh, and we can go in cycles or can we say we all have one like CD player or something and then we're going to have to discuss what music we're going to play tonight. Wouldn't that build up community instead of separating us? Because what folks want is not individuality. What they want is four markets where they had only one. See, so if they have one, if they have this group of four people and they can sell one CD player to that group of four people, well, that's one market. But if they can tell you, well, you know, you have your own mind and you're your own individual. You want to listen to the, to the music of your old man because he, they don't care whether you're an individual or not. They want two markets where there was one. They want three markets where there was one. We need to, we need to kind of look through that advertising that PR, that we also use to sell war, by the way. So I think we need to kind of think about what if somebody said, advertising turns wants into needs. Toyota, you need this car. Do you really or not? So we need to kind of, eventually, I, I hate to say it, but eventually we're going to have to become a little bit more spiritual, I think. Mm -hmm. And that usually helps us to deal with the physical and material a little bit more. I think Sister was very happy to hear that. Thank you, Katie. Yeah, I, I just spoke. Oh, she just spoke. Are you, if I can follow up on that. Oh, or are you on the same topic? Uh, not really. <laughs> oh, good, Dick Thank you. Well, just the example you gave is, um, you know, of sort of restorative justice or talking together. That seems to work in smaller groups. You know, you have 15 or 20. So is some of the issue the scale of our governments, our mass... Um, cultures or whatever, and then so how do you generate an alternative when we are masked? Yeah, I, I know, I think that's, that, you know, uh, Rousseau said the same thing about democracy, by the way. You remember reading that. He said, democracy sounds really good, but you, it gets too big, it, it gets out of hand. You, you can't do it. But, uh, and he's probably right. But I think that I've seen, in the Philippines, for example, one of the things that, I'm, I'm sure you know about the Philippines and their overthrow of the Marcos dictatorship, but really that started with, um, with Catholics, starting uh, starting uh, small Christian communities in parish after parish after parish. And after a while, whether they liked it or not, the bishops got conscientiousized. Well, how did that happen, really? There's a story about this bishop who was, he had just ordained some priests, and he, they were ordained for about five months, and uh, he wanted to see how they were doing, and uh, he, so he sat together with them, and he said, and this one young priest said, well, you know, I was giving out communion, and this couple came up, and I knew they were living together, and I knew when they were not married, and then I thought, well, should I give them communion, or should I not give them communion? I don't know. I don't want to embarrass them. Should I, what kind of decision should I make? And then, so finally I said to myself, what would Jesus do? And the bishop said, you didn't do it, did you? Well, the point is that sometimes even bishops have to be conscientiousized, you know. After the, after the election, um, I think you have to have a little bit of a Catholic background on this one, but after the election, Marcos stole the election. Uh, all the bishops got together, and this was from the pressure of the people who had just undertaken nonviolent resistance for months and months and months, and the bishops were forced to go along with them. They met in, con in Congress, and they said, Marcos has stolen the election. There was no, there was no doubt about it. And um, no one can forgive him this sin in confession unless he returns what he has stolen, namely the presidency. And now every Catholic is bound by conscience to resist his presidency with every nonviolent means available to them. The bishops. God. Well, anyway, the point is, it just, it's just amazing what can happen once, once these small groups get together and then... They consciously would have, uh, you know, a small Christian community get together around the cathedral, and then this, this small uh, group from this parish would meet this small group from this parish with these small, and they're all talking the same language. And then there's this, it, it's a, it's a deep kind of communion. I know that at Marquette University Center for Peacemaking, we send our students out pretty much different places. We've already sent them to Liberia, to Israel, Palestine. We sent the older people to, to Pakistan and Afghanistan. To, to Cape Town, South Africa, and what we've done is we've Skype-linked those students in those different places with the inner-city students, uh, segregated inner-city students in Milwaukee. And it's wonderful to watch those conversations take place when they're all speaking the same language and are engaged in the same projects in different parts of the world and realizing that they're not just operating in their own little ghetto or neighborhood or segregated township. They're part of a global movement. And I think that as we 
this is one of the advantages I think we have as we more and more communicate with each other these strategies and this this kind of community dynamic it it just can't help but get bigger and bigger and people know the rules enough the, the rules of nonviolence enough to be able to um, to be able to continue that because when they uh, they threw Marcos out the the nonviolent movement there were how many people there, there were somewhere in the neighborhood of two or three million people in the streets of uh, of Manila and there was no violence and they all they all got along pretty well and no one no one killed anybody and no one hurt or harmed anybody but they all knew the rules of nonviolence and the practices of nonviolence and they stayed coherent millions of millions of people stayed coherent and eventually caused the dictator and his shoeless wife to leave so uh, <laughs> So really, and, and also too, if you, I know Dittmar can tell you a lot more than I can about um, about the uh, nonviolent movement that pretty much started in Germany and then pretty much swept through all of the countries that were under Soviet control and uh, even the satellite countries and pretty soon, see you later. Well, I think the Pope had something to do with that. But anyway, the fact is that we have seen mass movements that have been, that have Really challenged and even and even removed the most the most unconquerable of governments. I mean, the Soviet Union had had uh, biological, chemical, nuclear weapons. People just got together and said, "We don't want you here anymore." And they said, "Oh, okay, we'll go back to Russia." I mean, it's not, these are actual true things that happen. It's not made up. I mean, they're historical in our historical memory. So, more, actually, the more massive we get, the better we are. I think. Anybody else want to speak to this topic of uh, how it's possible to really bring an end to war altogether? Uh, okay. Yeah. Simon, thank you very much for your sense of humor. You're and, welcome. And you're very, you can't have a sense of humor in this game. <laughs> and your very practical uh, you know, talk. Um, I wanted to bring up two things. You talked about uh, you know, how people can get together and uh, move their topple their governments. But what about the Occupy movement in the U.S., for instance? You know, the moment they gather together, there is militarized violence in civilian uh, public court, uh, civilian and public uh, spaces, which have cleared them out. That's the one question. But the other thing is, I was really interested in commenting on the justice, justice and war thing. As you were speaking, I remember hearing a lecture by Howard Zinn, he was cool, right? called Three Holy Wars. Yeah, yeah. And the wars that he spoke about are the American War of Independence, right. uh, the Civil War, uh -huh. and uh, World War II. And the question he asks is, has anybody heard anything bad, said anything about the right. founding fathers? Right. You know, but the main thing he talks about is a just, uh, the difference between a just cause and a just war. Mm -hmm. And then he throws up a balance sheet between having a just cause and then a balance sheet where two, three million people, of course there are no totals available, yeah, right. of people killed in, in every war that right. he can name. Right. And he discusses them in, in the, uh, using class rather than, yes. uh, you know. Yes. Very it's a fascinating lecture and I thank you for, uh, you know, uh, approaching it because I yes, remember I've heard, that thing. I've heard that lecture. It's, he's wonderful. It's a, it's a terrible loss. It was terrible mm -hmm. to lose Howard that way. Mm -hmm. So yes, Thanks. but it's true. Thank you. Um, it, it is true. I mean, it, it's true. I'm reading a book called The Cost of War. I wish I remembered the, uh, the, the, the author of it. But what he's pointing out is that whether, whether you win or lose the war, you always reduce your freedom. Always. Especially the winners. Like, you know, when did the United States institute the income tax? During the Civil War to, suppo to support this, the Civil War. And support the North in the Civil War. I think it's still here. And when did we start the Pentagon? Well, it was, we were told that after the war was over, the Pentagon would be turned into a hospital. We still give, it's true, we still give the Pentagon about $750 billion a year. Just the Pentagon. So, I mean, and, and then, of course, more and more you have what we're, we're beginning to call the imperial presidency, because more and more, in order to engage in war, you need to focus more and more authority on the, on, with a single individual or a single branch of government, the executive branch of government, and more and more dissenters like me are going to be, are going to be repressed. And those, those, um, those, um, those established kinds of institutions, whether it's laws or whether it's actual buildings or whatever, they remain after the war is over. 
And so somehow, even though you say you're fighting for freedom, the bottom line is always you're less free after the war than you were before. And I think everybody knows that, really. So maybe after a while we want to push back. But one of the things about the Occupy movement I think is we need to work on a little bit more is that it, it's, it, it's, still, it's still in the passive stage, you know. There are two phases of nonviolence, as you know. The one is, you know, do no harm, but the other is cling fast, satyagraha. You know how to pronounce it better than I do. Uh, cling fast to the truth, which is the resistant part. So far, the, we haven't done enough um, effective resistance. It's one thing to stay in a place and disrupt the operations, but to, to actually think of what would effectively disrupt the system that is so oppressive, that's pretty exciting stuff and calls for a lot of creativity. And I think many more meetings among folks who are a little bit more experienced on nonviolence than, than not. And it may mean such things as massive withdrawal of the willingness to pay income tax. Mm -hmm. Pretty much that'll do it, you know, uh, or even to pay even sales tax. Fifty Over 50% 50 of the American uh, of the American budget, over 50% is spent on war making. So if we start to take away their power, their monetary power to take to kick war, well then they probably may have to reevaluate their position. You know? So and there are many people who have gone, who have chosen not to pay their income tax, their income tax resistors. Some because they just make sure that they don't earn enough to pay income tax, and some who just say, I'm not going to pay income tax and come after me if you want to. So it is, it's a matter of sacrifice. My own sense is if we don't, if we aren't willing to sacrifice at least as much as the, as the soldier, right? I mean, the soldier is going to go out, he's going to kill or be killed for the corporations, right? And, or for getting more money or something else like that. And if he's willing or she's willing to do that just so that he can get more money or, or more oil or more zinc or whatever it is that week, you know. Um, and if we're not willing, to do that, then we have nothing pretty much to say, really. We have to be ready to step up and say, okay, I'm willing to go until it costs me my life. And I guess that for that it means a certain kind of a spirituality that is able to sustain that kind of commitment, I believe. Which is when you see the great, the great nonviolent people like Dorothy Day or Gandhi mm -hmm. or King or, of course, Jesus, they all had that deep spirituality that kept them going even when the death threats were clear. So, something that I'm encouraging people in the middle of a philo philosophical discussion is, we ought to get better spirituality, I think, than we have. Oh, yeah, one of the, back in the, in, in the, 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 not the last election, but before the last um, election, during the Republican National Convention in, um, in New York City, uh, a bunch of us decided that we were going to demonstrate against the, the war. The the, um, the sanctions of the war against Iraq were still going on, and you know there was still there was an increasing disparity between rich and poor. So we decided that we wanted to demonstrate against these things, especially war. And uh, as we gathered to demonstrate um, near the near the place where the two towers were destroyed, um, as we gathered, the police put a cordon around us. Uh, handcuffed us about about 160 of us, and then put us in cart, made us sit in the gutters for an hour and a half, and then put us in these trucks, handcuffed with a in the with the not with the, the new handcuffs are like they're like twist ties, they're plastic, you know, and they're you put your hand behind your you put your hand behind your back, and it's it's then cinched up. It's quite painful. And then you, you ride in these trucks, and they put us in a special warehouse, which had been reserved for um, vehicles. It was all cement, and they had set up chain link segments uh, in uh, in the warehouse. And on the cement was all this was gasoline and and uh, all kinds of uh, fluids from uh, vehicles that were quite toxic. And they put us there and held us there for three days. The chain link fences went up to about 10 feet, and then over the chain link fences was, was um, razor wire. We were held there for three days, um, and then we then they confiscated all of our, our all of our in, uh, our uh, papers, all of our licenses, and everything, and put them in a, in one in one uh, 
uh, like a mobile home type of place. So it took us another two days to get through to get our to get our licenses back. So they effectively stopped all. Uh, then they put us in jail and they they chained our 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 feet to each other and marched us through the jail and kept us in jail for another day. And then Larry released us and put us and said, okay, it's going to take you two more days to get your stuff back. So they effectively just silenced all retreat, all uh, dissent. Um, and we have, we have, we still have uh, lawsuits against them. It's still in, in progress. They go on and on forever for violation of our civil rights. But that's the world that we're moving into now. Uh, we, we have to have the courage. I mean, if we're not willing to sacrifice, I mean, I know the early the early founders of our democracies. They what did they used to say? Our lives, our fortune, and our sacred honor. Has that changed any? I mean, democracy doesn't deserve that anymore. We have to pledge our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor if we ever want to have a democracy. And if we're not willing to do that, I don't think we deserve one. So, and I don't mean that we're going to take somebody else's life. I think it's probably right. If I have a conviction, it should cost me my life. It should cost you your life. It's my conviction. It should cost me my life, not yours. Why should my conviction cost you your life? A silly thing. I'm willing to put up my life for my convictions, and or my fortune, or my honor. And I believe if we aren't going to do that. Then we don't really deserve a democracy. Okay. Would you uh, care to speculate on future wars? and the, very, the possibility of future wars, and I'm thinking particularly of water issues around the world, sure. and uh, very much afraid the Americas are going to want to come in and take our water because uh, you're running out. Yeah, because we don't. And We're not, not, happy with not that we have all that much either. Uh, I think only 2% of, uh, of the world's arable water is in Canada. That is the potable water. Right. So if you have some thoughts on that. Well, I'm trying to remember... Uh, I was on a panel with this guy who had wrote, written a book called Resource Wars, and that's his, that's his claim that from, from now on wars are going to be over resources, and water surely will be, will be one of them, you know, uh, potable water will be certainly one of them. But then when you think about it, so is oil, it's maybe not as necessary as water, but I mean it's another resource that we're, that we're after. Uh, one of the things that we've been doing in the United States is developing a whole new set of nuclear weapons that are smaller, we would call them probably tactical nuclear weapons. So future wars will be fought not only with, we already have a set of nuclear weapons we call depleted uranium, which are really almost the definition of evil, but um, we're talking about actual nuclear explosions in small, with small warheads uh, that, that will, will probably wage the next war with, uh, because we have the technology to do that. So um, I guess, Know, what the, it's something that we need to pay paying attention to, yes. But I think that I think that if when people, I don't know. Let's think about what the early. I, I only have a, a, a probably limited American view on things. But what would you think the first earliest maybe Continental Congresses looked like? You know, do you think they were people very much different than you and I sitting here saying, "Wait a minute, this isn't working. We got to fix this. What are we going to do?" You know. I think this is what democracy looks like. It's a bunch of folks sitting around saying, look at the way things are going, we're not happy with it. Let's get together and try to figure out what neat the next steps are in order to be able to do that. And then you had all those people writing those wonderful pamphlets and everything else that people would be informed and people had their own newspapers and after a while they had their own script, you know, that would substitute for the British money so they could not have to buy into the British, the British, uh, the British overlords. We're creative enough, I think, to, to start to get together and not just sit here and listen to each other, but I mean, not just here to listen to me, but <coughs> sit there and say, listen, okay, now what are we going to do? Maybe four or five people can call each other up at the end of today, or six people can call up the other day and say, okay, you want to get together and let's talk about this? What's our next step on water? What's our next step on fracking? What's our next step on oil? What do we do, you know, and how do we, how do we move forward on this in such a way that it's It'll create peace, and it'll also create a better, better community, human community for us. Hi. Hi. I just wanted to comment um, with regard to getting together. I mean, we've all, we've got these organizations. Um, a big problem with it is the apathy uh, of, of the populace. 
you know, have a demonstration. The police now, even in Edmonton, they're saying you can't even be on the sidewalk. You know, one we were at the other day, they wouldn't let us even on the sidewalk in front of the WCB. We had to go at some church, let us stand on their lawn. Mm -hmm. um, I, I really believe, um, over my last 20 years of activism, is, is um, that, and, and knowing the ecological problems and the convergence of all this stuff, yeah. that, uh, it's going to take um, a real catastrophe and a, and a real breakdown of so-called society. That's when, when we, when we're missing the things that we had. That's when maybe we'll give pause and start again in small groups to try to build up something a little more fair. But um, all these efforts that we're putting into now, with the corporate power um, putting in place our governments, yes, right. I, I don't know how we're going to do it. Well, you know, I, I, you know you're, I'm, not, I'm not familiar with the Canadian, uh, of course, setting, but. Mm -hmm. You know, if you think about how entrenched, for example, uh, the John Crow, the Jim Crow laws, sorry, John Crow, Jim Crow laws were in the South. I mean, it was just the way things were forever and ever. Everybody bought into that, including the blacks. And yet somehow, you know, they, the, the people found enough, uh, enough courage and enough resources to literally fill up the jails. I mean, what would it look like if, if, if people said, okay, I can't gather here, that's fine, I'll, I'll gather here anyway. They're going to put me in jail. Go ahead and put me, these 30 people in jail, and then put these 60 people in jail, and put these 100 people in jail. You know, now what's going to happen? How are people going to deal with that? That may, that may be a kind of a non-violent way of causing a catastrophe that would cause people to say, wait, this is not working anymore. So I'm saying that we, we, if we're willing to kind of sacrifice ourselves, you know, as that's kind of like the, one of the rules of nonviolence, I guess. That we're willing to sacrifice ourselves and just say, okay, if it means prison, it's going to mean prison. If it's going to mean fine, it's going to mean fine. Normally, I, we don't pay the fine, but then that also causes more trouble because they have to have more court rulings in order to have this this thing. But I think that you know we can we can strain the justice in a nonviolent way. We can strain the justice system so that it becomes less and less workable in its at attempt to repress freedom. And it would mean sacrifice. It may mean days in jail. It may mean days in jail for you and, and friends and everything else. But look at that. Remember the suffragists? Mm -hmm. uh, they used to, they, they were pitched in jail and they poured boiling water down their throats. And these things don't come, you know, naturally. They come because people sacrifice. I they, my point is I don't think I'm sorry. Okay. Yes. I, I guess um, I just don't think there's enough people with that kind of grit or you know, conviction. You know, I, I think I, I was. I'm always surprised when we start something like this. How many people get infected? I, I remember. It sounds like it's a funny. It's a funny little uh, uh, little example. But when we and I was at the university, I was. I caused a great deal of trouble because I I said. That the uh, that the janitorial staff was not being paid a living wage, and so um, I got so there were a couple of other st teachers who thought this too, two others, and then there were like four or five or six students. You know how idealistic they get, and we met. I think every week. I don't know how it happened. We met every week for like for like a, a semester. Uh, saying, look, we're gonna, and we kept coming up with new ideas for how we were going to draw attention to the fact that. That this that, that the janitors were not being paid as a living wage, and the kids were really creative about it. And then we would come up with ideas, and the kids would vet it, or we they'd come up with ideas, and we would vet it. And then finally, I I was given some kind of a visiting directorship or visiting professorship, and I had to go somewhere else. And while I was gone, the kids took over the um, of themselves took over the administration building and refused to leave until the janitors got a. Um, uh, by themselves. I, I didn't say anything to them. They had just gotten infected. They just took over the administration building and said, we're not leaving until uh, you give the janitors a living wage contract. Then they said, then the administration said, okay, you won't graduate. They said, we don't want to graduate from a school that treats people mm -hmm. like this. And then they called the New York Times and said, you know, Jesuit schools are supposed to have justice, but we don't see any justice for the janitors. And the, so the New York Times came in and then, and then then that was really fun, and then they, uh, and then they, um, 
And then they said, okay, we will, re we will renegotiate the contract. And then they delayed another three days, and they, then the students went on a hunger strike, and, it, and they had the con new contract within three days. I mean, you don't know. You're looking at these students. They're like 20 years old, and you think, what, the, what can they do? I'm the adult here. But somehow people get caught up into it. And when they get into it, they just, you just, the movement, it's why it's called the movement. It's a movement because you get caught up in it and you can't help but move. You're caught up in the movement. So all you have to do is just start with a few people. It's surprising. It always surprises me. And somehow the movement starts and you get pulled along with it. And maybe that's not your experience, but it's always been mine. You know. Well, I understand the 60s. Yeah. There's a hell of a lot going on. Well, this was not the 60s. Oh, this was the 90s. Oh, it was. Yes, it was. <laughs> I just think that there was a hell of a lot more activism and, and... Not in the 90s. Oh, boy, goodness. All these kids wanted was money. <laughs> I'm talking long before that. Uh -huh. But, you know, today, when we go into protest uh, student hikes um, and um, at the university... The tuitions. Um, the students don't come out. You know, the police show up, won't even let us on the grounds of the university. This is Edmonton. Sure, I know. Um, but this, I also deal with the United States, which I think might have a little bit more repressive uh, resources than even Canada does. And I, I really, as I said, I, I really have watched people that you wouldn't even think that these were the people that you would stand up, you know, uh, and say, it, this is what, this is, I'm not backing off you. You wouldn't be, you just, I'm just surprised. And I'm just offering you the possibility of surprise as well. Uh, um, any, uh, anybody else want to chime in here? I'd like to uh, actually ask you about um, something which I find quite alarming. Um, and that is the... Um, resort to robots and drones in warfare because it looks to me like uh, warfare is tending um, to a situation really in which um, human beings, uh, at least on one side, don't come under fire, aren't firing at uh, other people, trying to kill other people uh, on the ground anyway. Um, but rather, what you've got is a bunch of very weird people um, operating drones from some base in Florida or somewhere, um, and uh, operating it like it was some sort of a game. Um, now, um, uh, I wonder whether this isn't going to make it far harder to uh, stop wars. Because, um, you know, back in the Vietnam days, um, what really brought that war to an end was the fact that uh, um, people didn't want to go off and fight there and uh, put their lives at risk, and they wouldn't do that. And uh, so they came out on the streets, and their parents came out on the streets, and, so, and people said no. And uh, that eventually well, it was a long, long struggle, as you know, but uh, it brought an end eventually to that uh, dreadful war. But now it's not the case, you know, that to fight a, a large war, you need a whole bunch of uh, people risking their lives. Um, and um, that strikes me as it's going to make it uh, very difficult to uh, raise, um, you know, protest get people excited about bringing it to an end. What do you think? Well, you know, I, uh, my friend Kathy Kelly always talks about the further invention of nonviolence. I mean, every time we have to at least match what they're doing with some other nonviolent strategy. I'm not sure what that would mean. I know that what we might do would be to make sure that we go to the universities and any, any co uh, company that is producing these on our unmanned combat vehicles, I guess it's what call UCVs, uh, whether they're airborne or on the ground, uh, that uh, that nobody signs up for that, or even not that we would not that we would just say, okay, don't sign up for it, but that we when we were doing that back in New York, we would assign certain people 
to interview for that particular job position for hours, you know, and then no one else could interview. It became quite effective. We also made sure, we also had many students sign a pledge not to work for particular companies because they were promoting war, and that they would pledge they would tell their friends not to. Hundreds and hundreds of these of uh, these of these uh, documents came in to a place like Halliburton, for example, and it was. I thought in the end it was fairly effective. I don't know. If, well, wait if we a minute. Out. I mean, Halliburton is still there doing its its not thing. In the, you're right. I not, mean, uh, it's not uh, in the United States. You know, anymore, I mean, uh, <laughs> but but it has. But it, right. But it has. Um, it, uh, it has been. It, it has. Not, it's not operating in the United States anymore. It's had to withdraw itself to another to another country. It's not drawing. It's not drawing uh, uh, people from from the United States anymore. And the fact that we we would be we would have sometimes reversals in our nonviolent struggle shouldn't discourage us that much because they have reversals in war too, don't they? And they still prosecute it. Well, I'm not talking about reversals, Simon. The thing is I'm talking about uh, a great success here, and that was bringing the Vietnam War to an end. But what did that require? It required getting a half million people out on the streets of San Francisco. It required a massive shift in public opinion, right? And why was there a massive shift in public opinion? It was because American um, men and women uh, were sacrificing themselves in a war that nobody could really, well, most people couldn't see much well, reason for. You have to get a very mass movement. You yourself spoke about Marcos. I mean, and getting millions of Filipinos out. That's what you have to do in order to bring to an end this sort of thing. And you, I don't see that happening when it's the case that you can fight these wars with very little uh, danger to uh, your own uh, men and women. Well, one, one way we can think about it, if you want to think about having to inflict danger on, um, on the people who are operating these, um, because uh, there, um, even just war theory would declare that the, uh, that pilots of planes are legitimate <coughs> targets. Pilots of, uh, the, that people who are operating, say, tanks, are legitimate targets. The fact that these people would be in a particular city, it, and that you would target them in that particular city, and then in just war theory say, well, it's collateral damage that we had to take out part of the city or part of that university in order to get this pilot. Look, we're really sorry. We're playing, but you played by that same rule. I'm not that I'm encouraging that, but I'm saying that just war theory would surely call for that, and uh, and that you know if you're worried about say there's not enough danger, well watch what happens when a half a city gets taken out because they're trying to target this particular group of people who are piloting these drones, and not only that, but now now that we've lost several drones in in Afghanistan and and in Iran, it's not going to be long before this technology is taken over by other people. I mean, military secrets are the most fleeting of all. So if we're if we're if if we're going to keep playing by those the, those rules that in all, it's only by danger that people are going to uh, that our people are going to operate, I always I don't always buy that. I know that a lot of the soldiers, because I'm around that age, who were in Vietnam were also major part of the resistance, and not because they not because they were afraid of being killed, but because they just didn't want to kill people anymore. It was a major movement among the among the uh, people, the, the military uh, people in Vietnam, and it were, there were newsletters all over the place on how to do resistance. So and I think that we can, we, can, we can still, we have to use the means of nonviolence if we want nonviolence. If we're going to use threat, which is a violent thing, in order to achieve nonviolence, I'm not sure that's the right way. I think we have to put enough faith in human nature to say, is this what we really want? And, and to, we have to uh, put enough faith in enough human nature to say, is this, do you really want to do this? Is this what you want to do with people? And if it means, for example, uh, as did the, uh, the plowshares people uh, during, that was one of the major movements also of the Vietnam War that really sparked people's consciences. Plowshares people who went in there and destroyed, or, or at least dam heavily damaged missiles and, and then and then draft records, it may mean that that may be a development of, of nonviolence that we have to come up with. But I really feel that we need to sit down and say, what would be an ideal nonviolent way to stop this new development of, uh, of robot wars that doesn't rely on threatening people? I, I hope you didn't 
understand me to be proposing that we threaten people with violence. Oh no, I'm saying no. That, that that no, I'm not saying that that's what you said. I'm saying that that I heard you say, and I may have mistook you to say, because people don't feel the danger. And I'm saying, well, well, maybe that may not be the uh, uh, that may be one approach to say they they may feel the danger. But another approach may be, to, again, to call on this common humanity that we have. Is this what we want to do to people, send in these robots and just gun them down? Or to, or to, I'm, one of the things I did when I went to Pakistan was to bring back <coughs> photos for people to see what the drones were doing, what the uh, drones were doing to the Pakistanis, and to report as well. I think that's very important. We have to be able to put ourselves out on the line and put ourselves where we ourselves can be bombed which is what we did, and then come back and say, look at this is what's happening on the ground over there. You have to know this, because one of the things, as you remember, that that, uh, that got us really charged up was that girl who had been napalmed, remember that? And she was running naked and made, everybody went, oh my God, are we doing this? So I think that if we were to go to these places, and it's been done by the peace movement before, I've done it, to a place like Pakistan and say, look, this is what's happening here, here are the photos, is this what you want? Is this the future that you want to have? happen for us. This is what the robots are doing. Is this what you want? I think we can play that common humanity card well enough, I think, to, to, to form a growing movement the way I think the sympathy of the people who more and more saw what was being done on the ground in Vietnam was called up. I, I hope that that would work. Does anybody want to continue on this topic? <laughs> yes. Maybe I have a comment uh, yes. on that. The drone is my I think if we are opposing war because of danger to our own people, um, then we need, and then we're not opposing war anymore because uh, our own people are not in danger because of drones, then we need to move to opposing war because of dangers to other people uh, as well, like the other uh, nations. Um, yeah. So. Yeah, and I'm, so like, I'm, I'm sympathetic to that statement. Yes. And I know that that was also part of our resistance to the, to the Vietnam War. Not only that we didn't want our boys killing, being killed, but a lot of the, the protests. And I was corrected on this by, by uh, a long time, not a long time ago, but a number of years ago. And I said, well, we, they, we just didn't want our boys killed. But I was corrected by a number of people that said, no, we, just, we also didn't want to kill all those people over there either. So I'm, maybe both things we have to go with, but I'm going to play my cards on the other side. <laughs> Just, just uh, one more comment. Drones are actually a uh, good tool for potentially uh, documenting uh, violence if it's used by uh, activists. Um, yeah, you could put cameras on drones. Are there any activists who have drones? <laughs> um, yeah, they're like all drones now. Yeah. That, that can fly over like protests and film everything. Yeah. All, all the police violence. Yeah. So. You know, in Chicago, there's a NATO conference coming up soon. Uh, the, police, the police have actually brought in a law saying that it is a misdemeanor to have a phone or with a camera so that it can be filmed. Uh, but this is just a comment on what the previous gentleman was saying. But, you know, uh, coming back to the idea of uh, human beings in war, right now we've got another huge propaganda campaign going on against Iran. Sure. Okay, where uh, the U.S. and Israel are, you know, it's o it's open news in the corporate me corporate right. you know mass right. uh, mass uh, media organs uh, which uh -huh. we call newspapers, and yet uh, there's a completely different kind of view coming across many uh, websites uh, website based uh, news media like for example Democracy Now, Antiwar.com, etc. But those increasingly are being taken over as well by uh, corporate media. So how is it that one can even stop this kind of propaganda campaign, which will no doubt lead to mass murder again, and yet it's okay. You know, it seems to be okay in most people, as the you know, previous commentators have pointed out, that there's an apathy, but yet as long as you do not see these pictures, as long as you do not see uh, dead soldiers being brought home, which was very common in the Vietnam sure. War, uh, you know, as long as you anesthetize the public into believing that there is no cost uh, on either side, mm -hmm. because the other people are never shown, right. they are never named. For example, this U.S. soldier who killed 16 Afghans. You know, we hear all about his, him and his family, but you don't hear a damn thing about any of the people who were killed there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, not even a name sometimes. 
you know, so how is that going to, how are we going to try and stop this kind of thing? And with increasing, uh, with the amount of uh, finance being uh, uh, put into weaponization yeah. of uh, not just the army, which is already weaponized, but even the police are being increasingly weaponized, you know, with all kinds of military uh, war uh, weapons. Mm -hmm. How are we going to stop this? I, you know, like the other lady said, you know, I feel quite despondent sometimes. It's good to come and listen to you. Honestly, I feel much better today you know, after having heard you. But certainly, but certainly, it's quite despondent, you know, to constantly be uh, be barraged by this kind of uh, propaganda, where where you know, you know, that there is going to be, there are going to be hundreds of thousands of people killed very soon. Sure. Well, uh, you know, I don't know, I guess it's a good, I mean, it must take great, a great deal of me to think that I can actually stop the propaganda machine, the military machine. I feel very good about that. Thank you for that compliment. But, um, you know, I think that we, I think that we can, what we just can't do is we can't stop. You know, we can't have, we can't stop having these conversations with our friends no matter how many times we're going to be ostracized and told, told that we're unpatriotic and told that we don't love America or freedom or democracy or that we're in favor of the, uh, of, this, of the Iranians, that we love Iran more than we love our own country or whatever it is, or that we're in favor of Saddam Hussein or whatever the, the char charge is going to be. I think we just have to keep pushing through that because uh, people need to hear that and people, we talk, people talk with each other and we, we, we can challenge the... We can challenge the media and say, well, that's not true, you know, and as many times people say, yes, it is, at least somebody is saying, no, it's not true, and if we can, we do need to do the work, but one of the things I know that, that may, that may startle you is that I, I, I just have a hope, and I, a hope, I call it, I call it my apocalyptic hope, and the apocalyptic hope is this, that every empire in the history of the world has done exactly what the United States has done, right, has over-militarized, has over-centralized power, has over centralized, has over uh, centralized the economy, has overextended itself, and has collapsed. So this is the death throes. I, I, it doesn't look like it. Looks like oh my gosh, we're the ones. But I mean, this is the death throes of an empire, and it's a it's a grim time. I know it's not going to be pleasant when the empire collapses any more than when the Roman Empire collapsed, or when the Greek Empire collapsed, or when the Russian Empire collapsed. But every empire in the history of the world has always done what we have done, and it's collapsed. So it doesn't mean as though I, I'm going to give up, but I'm not as despondent maybe in this fact that I know that I can take a little time off and have a beer because these guys are destroying themselves, you know. And sooner or later, whether it's because they attack Iran or because we've spent so much money on the military that our teetering economy just collapses, you know, it, it, it's, it's just not going to last. This can't last. Not even, even ecologically, this can't last. So... These are the death throes, and, and I, that's why I, I hold to nonviolence, because we're trying to, trying to let folks down easy, because if we start attacking, then, you know, then it'll, the, the, the negative response, the military response will be enormous and, and deadly. So I think if we keep trying to hold to nonviolence, which is basically we're going to keep holding to the truth, and we're going to keep resisting no matter what, and we're going to need to find the energy and courage and the, the, our self-sacrifice, I think people are kind of, at least kind of impressed by self-sacrifice. I think if people see that we are willing to, uh, to, to give up our lives, fortunes, and sacred honor for a particular... Uh, I think it calls on something in people that says, wait a minute, this can't, wait, what is this guy doing, or what's this gal doing? Why, is that, why are they standing up and risking all of this? They, they, they're very respectable people, they're not crazy. I, I think it calls on people to... To, to pay attention to something that goes beyond what they hear on the television or, or what the military is trying to tell them. I think that's the kind of faith that we have to have because the, if we do that, then the world that comes out the other side will be more human, you know, other than the world that's just blown up because we just, you know, because we just, um, we just entered into one too many wars. Thank you. Okay, I'm just going to... Oops, oops. Just uh, one more comment, and then we're going to take our break, and you can all recharge your teapots. Okay. No, very briefly, uh, Simon gave us a long lecture on war profiteering, and one of the ways of being nonviolent is to expose exactly that our media is street propaganda, 
And so there were 200 million given to a particular company in the U.S. to sell the Iraq war. Uh, so we need university students and others, uh, and maybe retired folks as well, to do the research and publicize what is the means that this message that now all of a sudden Iran is the enemy, just the way the Saddam was the enemy, and, and, and they do focus groups, they do research on that, um, to see what messages are the ones that the population will fall for. When you expose that, it takes some of that power away. All right, so uh, we'll uh, break for about 20 minutes and uh, then come back for a, uh, a finishing up session. <coughs> I would like to uh, question your initial premise. Okay. That violence I, is not natural? <laughs> you, you feel naturally I, violent toward me? Now I, 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 I feel that I certainly have a violent streak in me. Uh -huh. And it's it still feeding back? Yeah, I think it's right. right. And uh, I, I feel, I believe also, and I think there is good evidence... To after, show, could you just step, step to the side because oh. th th those two speakers are giving us the feedback, All right? right? Nobody wants that. <laughs> anyway, I um, I think there is ample evidence that uh, shows that human beings have as much a violent side to them as they have non-violent side. We're animals. Uh, Jane Goodall watched the chimps. Marching. Uh, I, think, I think we may want to make a qualification just to be, because I'm a scholastic uh, scholar, we're rational animals. They're not just animals, we're rational animals. There's a difference. Just put that well, down. I think it might be questioned. Uh, <laughs> you can question it, but I think if you're going to use that category, then you're going to want to stay in that philosophical reference. Right? All right, I'll give that to you. Perhaps. Oh, perhaps. Me and Thomas Aquinas, or do you want to just, you know, <laughs> Albertus Magnus, those guys, are they okay? Well, I don't, I'm not quite sure about them either. Okay, well, but um, I would like to say that I do think human beings have, have a tendency for violence, which is very prevalent. And um, I think that a lot of what goes on in our society uh, has to do with ways of, of curbing, controlling, or redirecting that violence. I think our hockey is an excellent example. They're talking about bringing in... They're talking about bringing in uh, some strange uh, uh, combat sport now that uh, is on almost no holes barred. Change uh, fighting, sure. Mm -hmm. um, I think that they, they, they're trying to do this with the excuse that it's a way of redirecting or rechanneling, you know, the young man's testosterone. And, um, and I think that it's very important that we take a look at the human being in a more realistic way. I love the way you see people, but I don't think it's realistic. And, um, well, ex okay, excuse me, but if, okay, go ahead, please, go ahead. And um, I think that it's only if we are rational and uh, logical about what we can observe uh, in terms of our being that we would be able to really do something um, that works. Because I think if we look at ourselves from too much of a a wishful thinking aspect. We don't have much hope in really controlling what we are. So you believe so, that... Uh, okay. Simon, uh, uh, I've got another person okay. who, who wants to speak sort of on the same right. theme. So right. I thought maybe if we had both of them speak, then, then, you, talk. then you can reply well, to them great. both. Okay. Okay. Hi. Uh, I, I strongly support what you say because I think you made some basic assumption uh, when you said that, you know, basically war was intended with Napoleon. Maybe to total, total, war, total war. But they used to have total war with the Crusade. And if you go far enough back, you can find it with the Roman, the Greek, the Assyrian, the Egyptian. When they declared somebody enemy, there was no, no uh, feeling of uh, humanity. They were 
men were killed, children were killed. If the women were young enough, they were taken off as slave. And so uh, war is not a modern invention. Total war. Okay. Excuse me, I, I think that you're, I was making a distinction, not maybe a necessary distinction, between total war and holy war. What you are describing is holy war. I, no, 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 no. Uh, look at no, the I'm Greek, not, not they, never, they never went uh, into holy war. They just killed each other uh, over the, uh, a port, over a business enterprise, over just being two different cities. Did you remember what I had, what, how I had defined total war? No. Okay, no. let's just I, get I, that clarified. Yeah. Uh, when, I, when I said I meant total war was universal conscription of everybody who was even capable of fighting. That, okay, that so go back to the until... Roman, or go back to the Greek, okay, and you but... will find that there was not a professional uh, uh, army. Yes, I mean, yes. Okay, they were all the people body were drafted, uh, whether they were farmer, uh, fisherman, or whatever. Um, I can think of the Detroit, uh, no, uh, say you call the Carthaginians. Uh, every time they went to war, everybody went on a ship. That, that's how they thought they were on the, on the sea. And they hired some mercenary to do war in the Roman went the other way around. They hired somebody to be sailor, and they march on land, and so on. Like you can go back to the Assyrian if you want, the Babylonian, the Egyptian. Okay. We have a tendency, like Lady said, to be violent. And if we want to get anywhere, we have to recognize that. And we have to do something to educate ourselves first and the other people, particularly the young people. Okay, and I, I acknowledge that we do have tendencies to be violent. I, will that have, make you happy right now? Good. No, no. Okay, good. I just want to let you know. Okay, good. Okay. <laughs> just, because I want people to be happy because no, then we're no, going to kill I, each other. I, I and then we would be violent. That would not happen. So, um, but th we have a tendency to be violent, yes. Yeah. Is that always approved by everybody? Is that looked at as something that's natural? Like, you know, we, we all breathe, that's na a natural thing. We all, we all weep, that's a natural thing. We give birth, that's a natural thing. But somehow, when violence is done, it's not always approved. Like when we, even we go back to this killing of the, the killing of Cain and Abel, it's not approved. It's not something that we say, okay, that's a wonderfully human thing to do. That's a medical thing, not, nothing rational about it. Okay, well, okay, well then, the point is that normally, the very fact that we're trying to curb violence, the very fact that we implore violence, the very fact that we say, gosh, this is not good that we should have people killing other people. Or that should go up for it. It's not good that we should have people killing other people. We have to try to find a way to stop this. It, it would be, if we would say, if we would say this was natural, and that was my statement, this is not a natural thing, people would say, well, well you know, it's natural to breathe. So we should try to, this, we should deplore that, and, and therefore we should try to stop it. No, that's not true. We don't do that. We say, oh, it's natural to give birth to children, so we should deplore that and try to stop it. But that's not true, because we see that this is part of the natural human way of doing things. But whenever we do violence, there's always something that says, well, this is a wrong thing to do. Even if it means that I'm going to strike you back, then it's a wrong thing to do. So my claim is that it's not a natural thing. Why would we stop it if it were a natural thing? I think any kind of uh, natural thing for a human being is natural in the sense that I mean, we are plastic, we are clay, we can be molded to believe one thing or another and to take responsibility for certain things. Uh, to use, uh, I don't know, you were talking about Arby's. I think the psychological study that have been done have found out that from 18 to 25, you are really susceptible to becoming a good soldier. Right. Over 25, they start having a hard time. Right. Over 35, it's a lost cause. Right. Uh, so, we are plastic. We can be educated. And even within soldiers, generally, we, we do not respond properly to indoctrination, if you want. But having gone through an army training with some buddies, and the first one that gets shot, then we become uh, uh, personal in the war. 
Yes, in other words, we have formed a, a human bond between this other person, and that affects us. But so thank we you for could supporting just, my position. We, we could just as well form a human bond with the other people we call the gooks, the Muslim or, or terrorist or whatever else. Well, you know, you're, you're worried. So school. we have to educate ourselves at the key. We, we are, cannot assume that we are good. We, That's an assumption. Okay, and I don't think that we can assume that we're violent either. That's an assumption. So let's talk about these assumptions. Yeah. Okay? You, you want to say that you have you have to assume that we're violent, and if no, I don't assume... I'm not assuming. Oh, okay, good. We are plastic. We can go violent, and we can go non-violent. Well, that, that's... I think his point is that by nature, we're not either. Uh, that is, we can easily go one way or easily go the other. I think that's, a, that's, I understand his point, but I know that um, the people I have in the, my friends in the universities who are doing the biological and neurophysiological studies tell us that when we do violence, we disrupt our system. Our, 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 our biochemical system was get disrupted when we do violence. One of the ways that... But that doesn't stop us. Well, it, it, it may disrupt us, but it doesn't stop us. But it's a good argument that it's not natural for us. If something disrupts my, a system that's operational and it disrupts it, you can't say, well, that's natural for that system. And disruption is not natural for a system. That's the very definition of, non, of a non-natural thing. So you mean to tell me that homosexual is not natural? I'm talking of sex oh, drive, no. Oh gosh, now you sound like the Catholic Church. Good for you. Okay. Uh, is, um, I was I raised think, a Catholic. I think, I think, oh, but I, I can tell. Yeah. Um, <laughs> everything has to do with sex. It's got to have something to do with sex and probably gay people too. So that's very clear. Um, okay. Um, no, I, I'm saying that, look, um, that, that evolutionarily speaking, right, if, if, if we were naturally violent to each other, we would not have evolved. In fact, that what everybody said that? Well, the point is that human beings, it's just that when we look at the anthropological, paleoanthropological evidence, human beings as a group of people did not have armored skin. We didn't have fierce claws. We don't have fangs. We don't run that fast. We're not, you know, we're a little bit more than embryos with hair. The point of the matter is the only way we could have evolved as a species was through cooperation. And not only does that show up paleoanthropologically, it also shows up biochemically within us. Whenever we are associated with each other, we begin to match metabolisms. Whenever we do, whenever we actually forgive people, actually the brain begins to function better. Whenever we do violence, the system, our biochemical system is disrupted. Signals are sent bad all over the place. You can get addicted to that. That's true. I mean, you can get addicted to it the way you get addicted to drugs. And I mean, even though it's damp, you, if your body is clearly being damaged, you can get addicted to it. And I think that's one of the things that we try to do. We try to addict people to violence so that they continue to do it. But an addiction is not a normal state. Uh, I'm sorry. The, the other night, I don't know who else might have seen it, but the other night on the nature of things, they had a, a, an incredible program on plants. Um, and on this program, they showed, botanists showed, how plants can actually change their chemistry uh, to communicate with each other. They change their chemistry to try to promote the growth of plantlings that belong to their own genetic group. However, when they introduced plants that were of a different genetic stock, uh, the other they found these plants changed their chemistry again to compete with these plants and to, uh, you know, discourage the uh, young of other plants from thriving. Now, it seems to me that if plants can do this, it is extremely natural for all of nature to compete and to nurture those within your own group. And when we compete today, we call it war. Okay, now let's let's see what you mean when you say within your own group. Do you mean humans? Exactly. Or Canadians? Or people who have blonde hair and glasses? Because you see, I think that's the nature of things, right? We have to understand what we mean by group. Well, we have the term in perhaps that lady who is a psychologist 
<laughs> yes. Don't, don't you study the concept of other? I'm not getting qualified. <laughs> okay. Um, we, we have the concept of other. And our group initially may be the family, then our community, then in Alberta, our province. And, and in the family, in your family, how does that work? Do you have people who are other than you in the family? Yes. Oh, who might they be? Well, is there, there, is there an opposite sex? And opposites? Well, totally I, I, opposite no, no, sex. no, 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 we're just being question. silly here. The concept of oh, other. I, thought you, I know you are. I'm just questioning. I want to know just what's, what do you think? You're being a sophist. <laughs> I'm trying to think what you, I'm trying to get you to define your terms. If somebody is not, you, not an, an other, well, isn't it a male other than a female? That's a pretty other. And yet somehow you seem to feel as though a family can be formed by this and, and somehow it's not going to lead to some kind of war. I, I'm just curious as to how, where you're coming from. Maybe you can explain that. Well, perhaps I'm missing it, but I don't quite understand what you're saying. Uh, to my mind, we form the concept of other, which can be beyond ourselves, so anyone who is outside of myself, and we fight with other. We fight with people just around us. We argue, we, we compete, we do all kinds of things. Then that other can be extended. And we include a family as our, we take our family as our group unit, and then anyone outside of that becomes the other. And then we can enlarge that circle until we get to the point of either a religious group or a national group. Uh, and so it goes. Okay, can I just... Pause that for a second and just think. Now you're talking about family as not other. Is that what you're saying? Well, that... <laughs> okay, so, so you, you know Greek mythology, right? Sorry? You know Greek mythology, right? Sometimes. Oh, good. Now, how did the Greek gods refer to, uh, react with their offspring, by and large? Awesome. Uh, one of them ate them. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, maybe and then maybe the idea of later. right, maybe the idea of family as the, as being other is 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 still obtains. In other words, that we somehow you're you're using family as a way of saying well, those people are not other, and yet in other cultures they are looked at as other to the point where fathers have to destroy sons, or sons have to destroy fathers, or mothers have to be against daughters, and that evidently is on other cultures that that's a that's a truth. But for you, you're saying that this is like a truth that it, the family is not another, and what I'm trying to say is, Anything how are you defining you this in such a way that you want to encourage us to be violent? No, you're missing a point. Right? Okay, please explain it to me then. I'm having trouble. Okay, I'm going to try again. Okay. All right, first of all, we are plastic, so we can go one way or another. To make the assumption that we are friendly being to start with is a wrong assumption. You have That's an assertion, but I don't know if it's provable. Okay, well, you're throwing out all sorts of things that I, I don't believe, evidence. and I, I am throwing out all sorts of things that you don't you seem to all hear. You're doing is so the point is, uh, what is fundamental is we we have to educate for peace. We what? have to fight against uh, what you call uh, the unnatural instinct. Okay? okay? I am saying that what is ever is natural. You can go from a killer over here to a saint, if you're a good Catholic, on the other side, okay. right? Uh, or what about you can Joan go Arc? from... I mean, she was in trouble. Sorry? I was saying, what about Joan of Arc? She was a saint. She killed her. Again, you're trying to throw, throw, throw uh, bits out to dislodge the, the path that I'm following. Right? Okay. Which is a very good Jesuit approach instead. Thank you. I'm working on that. Thank you. So you the, the, by who? The, the point, the point maybe that I, I, I was trying to make earlier is that this discussion is a waste of time because you don't want to see the point and you are unwilling to discuss it in a reasonable manner. You keep throwing out bits and pieces that don't make any sense. Maybe not Except to you. To you. Maybe not to Except you. Except to you. Here's what I'm saying. You're trying to I already you. acknowledge that we're capable of violence. Yeah. I don't know why that's that's not acceptable to you. Tell me why that's not acceptable. We are capable of violence. We are. Does that make you? Is that okay? Yeah. Are we all set with that? Yeah. But I have noticed that when we do, are, when we are capable of violence, 
by and large, in the human community, that's not acceptable. People are not acceptable that accepting that that you would do violence to her. Or I, she I, do I, her I don't know where you get that from either. I mean, violence is very acceptable in most human communities that I, I know of. It's very acceptable here in Canada. Well, um, I mean, right? I mean, so uh, you know, I mean, and when I grew up in the United States. Very acceptable down there. Well, I mean, I, I so, think maybe we're talking about a nature-nurture type of, uh, uh, of discussion here. I think that we can be nurtured like an addiction to, to like something that's damaging for us. Look, uh, the, uh, another point is that uh, something can be perfectly natural, but it can be carried to extravagance, and then we have to put uh, restrictions on it. So, for example, sex is per perfectly Natural. I'm not a Catholic, by the way, so, oh, yes. so you, you can't, can't accuse me of... All right. The, um, uh, sex is perfectly natural, but it can be carried to extravagant degrees, and you have to put uh, restrictions on it. I think that's all that happens in human communities. Violence gets carried to extravagant degrees, and has to, uh, restrictions have to be put on it. They're now in Canada, finally coming around to thinking about putting some restrictions on... Uh, violence in hockey. Um, so uh, that's the way it goes with natural things, you see. I mean, uh, uh, sometimes they are bad when they're okay, or when they're done in the wrong circumstances, right? I mean, sex is perfectly natural, but if you do it with your friend's wife, uh, that's pretty bad. Right? Now, <clears throat> now uh, uh, similarly, uh, when violence is carried out, uh, in a situation where you're uh, stealing or, uh, or trying to uh, cheat somebody, well, that's bad. But it's bad because of the circumstance. Something perfectly natural, an instance of it, could be very bad given the circumstances. But I'm wondering how, for example, how would we determine that having sexual intercourse with your best friend's wife is bad? Isn't that a cultural thing? I think that's off the point. I mean, we're yeah, going to get into a, yeah, another that's, whole that's, thing. No, I, I think mean, that's what now, you're, now you're talking about what are the origins of morality. No, that's and, what I'm saying. We're and talking nature sort of and nurture here. And I don't know if that can ever be. I, you know, I, I frankly am up in the air on that topic. Um, yes, right. I try to think about it in philosophy, but I've never sure. really come to any firm conclusion. Yeah, I'm sure, but I'm thinking that, that, I'm thinking that if we... It, it, that that if, we, if we're up in the air on it, on it, then I think just to say that violence is therefore natural, uh, I think that's not an up in the air statement, right? My, my point was not that violence is natural. What I was saying was is that your argument that it isn't natural doesn't hold water. That is, it's perfectly possible to take natural things in certain directions, at cer in certain circumstances, or to certain degrees in which they become bad. And I think what I'm saying is that if, if a particular action disrupts a system, then it would be hard to say, well, that's natural for that system, that's okay for that system, because it disrupts it. And we have evidence that when we do violence, brain signals get messed up, the biochemistry gets messed up. We have that evidence, and so how are we going to say, oh, that's very natural, even though it disrupts the system? That seems to be contradictory to me. That's all I'm saying. Well... In a certain sense, I was arguing about origins is um, challenging, right? It's, it's hard to get back there. But uh, everybody in the room here has acknowledged violence exists and that education and nurture has an important role to play on what we do uh, with the violence that we find in human communities. And so the, the issue is, in part, why does our culture or the American culture uh, nurture from childhood on a particular way of actually highlighting, if you want, both competitiveness and violence uh, as the way to be successful rather than nurturing what is also possible for humans in cooperation and collaboration. I mean, every, every corporation, even for all the destructive stuff that they can do, can only function if they actually cooperate at a, right. a high level. So I think that's where the, our focus should be, because origins, yeah, we can talk for a long time, and I, I think there's, there's a good points. I mean, I, I can buy the point that we're plastic in a sense. You know, you can see people very quickly becoming aggressive or violent. So then the question is, what do we do with that reality? Um, and as I hear you uh, speak, I think what you're saying is, 
we have to learn both to resist and find alternative ways of dealing with, rather than being aggressive, we, you know, whatever, we nurture in, in, in your Marquette Peace Center other ways of dealing, for example, with conflicts rather than uh, living out the violence in terms of I'll smash your face in or whatever. And, and here we just throw them into the arena, into the hockey rink, and then they can do it. We call them enforcers. They're allowed to do it. The law can't get them, right? right. If they did the same thing two step, two inches outside of the boards, right. that's assault and right. battery or something. Right. But anyhow, so I think that's the issue is what is the nurture, what is the educational uh, function, why does our climate, especially the climate either in the empire or in the shadow of the empire, encourage violence from childhood on, you know, whether it's through the toys, what we see on television, the games we play, etc., and how do we find an alternative way? Uh, and, and so in that sense, being realistic, yeah, people are aggressive, okay, then how do we realistically move away from nurturing what is possible amongst humans? We, you know, Obviously, our history has shown that, it, that we're very capable of violence, and you agree with that. Sure, sure. I think that's, that's the question that I would like for us to ask. In other words, if we, and we were asking at the very end, okay, we have this huge military complex with this advertising and PR and everything else like that, and, and, and how are we going to defeat that because we know it's, it's, it's going to be bad for us? But that's exactly the question that I've been trying to, to get us to think about. How do we, how do we address that in a, you know, from our humanity without turning into the kinds of people that you know, just are going to be con conflictual all the time? Because I believe that the strength comes from our cooperation as groups rather than as people set off against each other. I believe that you know enough of the history kind of shows that. Okay, I, I think maybe we should uh, switch to another topic. I think we've uh, pretty okay. exhausted that one, so I'll turn to another speaker. Uh, I, I was going to bring up an old thing that was mentioned about apes living in <clears throat> in isolation with their immediate family. There was some evidence discovered, and I can't give you details, but I read it, uh, paleo evidence that groups, uh, a group of, a multiple collection of apes were found, or the evidence was found. And what occurred to me then was to ask the question, what would be the difference between that group and these other apes that cannot live as a group? And I don't know what the difference was, but I said to myself, these, this group had to put up with each other's failings. Now, today we might call that charity. Yeah. So, if humans evolved in a way that we achieved what we did in terms of living together as a group, we too must have had to do that. So, from there stems the claim that yes, not being violent or being considerate is a greater force and necessary to our development. If you go along those lines, and a lot of things you're saying, a lot of things you're saying, all of these things make sense. And even this, the plastic thing about nurturing to try and avoid uh, doing the wrong thing also makes sense. I don't know if anyone else feels that way. Thank you. I like that reflection. I'm sorry. <laughs> I can't let this go. Uh, first of all, in, in those, again, Jane Goodall, who happens to be a heroine of mine, uh, what she observed in the communities of the ape, the chimpanzee, was that there was a very distinct power structure there, a power structure that very much reflects our power structures. And that the top ape was always in control, and how he controlled the group was not by, by simply sitting back and uh, accepting individual differences, how he controlled the group was by very violent means. If you got out of hand, you were pounded. And wherever you get social groups, uh, anywhere from uh, <laughs> the naked African bull rat <laughs> to uh, you know wolf packs, lion prides, control within that group is based on dominance and violent repercussions. He wants to spot. That ignores the whole concept of evolution of humans. If we were that way, we should have stayed that way. We should not have developed into communities and cities and so on and so on. So there is such a thing as an evolution of the human spirit, if you like, or the way we live, and we are able to suppress these tendencies if we are raised correctly 
and get over that. Why did evolution not work the other way? Well, if, if you read the, uh, some of the other Jane Goodall works, that's exactly the, the issue she's raising. Like, we have to, in fact, transcend through whether she counts a conscience or, and says, will our moral conscience uh, be fast enough to catch up with our capacity, technologically, etc., etc., to do this massive violence? That is the challenge for the human race. So she doesn't limit us. She does show, yes, there is violence within, you know, uh, other primate communities, and, and more than some people have thought of, right, that they can do violence to others. But then her question is ultimately, you know, we also have a moral evolution. Can that moral evolution be fast enough, right, to then change uh, what we have in terms of the amazing powerful tools to do destruction to everybody, including our very basis for living? You know? And I also wanted to add that there are also significant movements among humans for liberation and freedom from domination like that. And so that's a characteristic human trait as well, pretty much since Exodus, right? So I think it might be factored in as also a feature of human beings that the resistance to domination and slavery and, and that kind of thing is a pretty important and significant feature of human beings. Not, and so domination is not the only feature. As a matter of fact, a much, I think to me a much more significant feature is the drive toward freedom and, and liberation. Um, on the the primate aspect, I, I wonder about bonobos, bonobos, which are supposed to be related to chimpanzees, and they're supposed to be more peaceful. So maybe, yeah, you can. It, it you know, of course, why they are more sex. peaceful. <laughs> they have more sex. That's their major control. Okay. <laughs> well, that was one comment, but my other one is that I think we. We as human beings have a tendency to carry out acts of violence, and I think we also have a tendency to prevent violence and care about when violence is done. And if we didn't have that tendency, we wouldn't have moral outrage when we see the effects of war, and you wouldn't have moral outrage when you see um, what's going on with the violence in hockey. And so I think we do, yes, maybe violence is part of, of who we are as humans, but I think it's more than that. There's also a part of us that says, no, violence is not okay, um, and I think if we want to stop wars from happening, we have to, to be able to show the violence that's going on and show those people as being members of our, our own community. Anybody got one more comment? I think if you want to uh, have a just and, and, and fair world, Put ten-year-olds in charge. <laughs> Get rid of the adults. Simon, do you want to have a last word on, on the ten-year-old comments? Uh, no, thank you very much, anyway, for inviting me. And it's this wonderful discussion because it's a discussion that's repeated so often, especially in I think in the first world, um, where we can and do and usually without without impu with impunity violence. But, I mean, I know that uh, in the many of the places where I've traveled, like, for example, the Philippines, where they did that nonviolent uh, revolution, or, or in other places, um, <coughs> I, I don't think this, this discussion may not take place. I think because the, the, uh, the investment has been in nonviolence, and there's been a formation in nonviolence, and a belief that the human being is nonviolent, and that's how that's pro proceeded. I think that a lot of this is a, is a, nurture, uh, is a nurture discussion, because we've been so inured to violence in our culture that it's, it's almost impossible to think of human beings without being violent and without considering violence. So I'm wondering if we might want to think not, I mean, just about this whole conversation as it globally and say, why is there such an insistence that violence is so, it's so intrinsic or it's so necessary a part of understanding what it means to be a human being? I just, I just am wondering about that, that's all. And so let's just think about how did we get to think that way? Because somebody must have trained us to think in certain ways. We were even trained to think as Jesuits, as you noticed. So somebody must train us somewhere along the line to say, how can you say human being without violence? How, where did that come from? And how come we all kind of share that same presupposition? Where did that come from? And why am I standing here saying, I don't, I don't think that it is necessarily part of human beings. And, 
so I'm just wondering, how did we get into this kind of discussion? That somebody is saying, no, I don't think violence is necessarily part of human being. And there are so many other people saying, of course it's necessarily part of a human being. How do we get there? That's just a curiosity question. All right. Uh, uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, Simon for leading this discussion in such exciting direction. So give him a round of applause. to, to uh, thank uh, the staff of Steeps. And finally, I want to remind you all that we will be having another and the last of this series of cafes next Saturday. Not two weeks from today, but next Saturday, right? So I hope to see you all out then. The topic's going to be justice and future generations. Thank you.